Okay, welcome everybody. Hoping everybody's doing well today on this beautiful Thursday. <clears throat> I wanted to just, uh, my name is John Charlone. I am one of the founders of Hummingbird Networks. Uh, we are a Cisco certified partner. We've been around since 2004, helping out with all different types of IT equipment and services. And I just wanted to give you some housekeeping rules of what's, uh, what's happening today. We're going to have an amazing webinar on the five pillars of SASE from Kurt, but I just want to let you know you will be getting the recording and slides in approximately one week after the webinar is over. Uh, you'll get an email with all that information. We're also going to be having some future webinars uh, around uh, modern, WAN, modern WAN connectivity, outbound cloud protection, inbound access protection, and some other stuff. So uh, stick around till the end for some of that. Uh, we're also uh, going to be giving away uh, some uh, licenses for uh, two Cisco products, uh, Duo or Umbrella. It will be the winner's choice, but uh, the winner needs to be here and needs to be present and uh, needs to be around till the end of the webinar. So please uh, sit down, relax, get your uh, favorite beverage, and um, we'll, uh, we'll get started. I'm going to introduce Kurt Purple, he's been the, uh, in our business for 25 plus years. He used to run an MSP in Phoenix and joined Ingram Micro in 2016 to focus on cybersecurity and collaboration architectures as a senior technology consultant. And he knows all the pains that we're going through. So uh, I'm really happy to have Kurt. Kurt, thanks so much. Take it away. Yeah, John, I appreciate that. Well, I, I, I have a beverage. It's not my favorite beverage, but uh, I have it here. So, yeah, thanks. We, uh, I don't have a ton of time here, so we're going to get right, jump in here uh, and talk a little bit about SASE today. This is really going to be an overview. I mean, this is a conversation that can last for hours and days, and we're going to have some follow-ups, as John referenced, uh, about some of the kind of deeper dives and some of the topics going to be covered here. But kind of quickly to go through what I'm going to discuss, <clears throat> kind of then and now, how did we get here? Like, why is this even important? This is something that, frankly, five, maybe 10 years ago, this wasn't even really a thing. Uh, and now it's perhaps one of the most talked about uh, topics from a cybersecurity standpoint. So how do we get here? What are the five pillars as defined by Gartner and kind of how do they apply to the, the network landscape from a vendor perspective? We're gonna talk a little bit about zero trust network access, which is also a, a big buzz phrase in the, in the industry. What does that even mean? And frankly, I think there's multiple definitions that are all accurate. I'll talk about that, but I think it's important to this discussion. Some kind of market trends, I think uh, sometimes things are overhyped and and I think SASE three or four years ago was talked about the next great thing and I think it is, but it wasn't three or four years ago. I think it is today. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, kind of how should I apply that to my organization? Frankly, I think almost all organizations have some version of this, but SASE is not a white or black thing. It's definitely shades of gray and lots of shades of gray. And, and where should I apply uh, this to my organization? And then finally, kind of the next steps. What do I do next? So with that said, I'm going to kind of jump into it real quickly. Uh, this is a lot as far as how we got here now. I think a lot of people probably know that, but I'm just going to do some housekeeping notes. We talk about cloud, public cloud, and just to kind of level set where everyone is. What is that? I mean, Azure, AWS, everyone kind of identifies those. Obviously, there are others, but those are public cloud. I mean, internet, everyone gets that. Private cloud, what does that mean? Generally, just having your own data center. It could be on site. Usually, it's not. It doesn't um, it get either way. And then finally, SaaS, applications that you're using that you don't actually own, that you're effectively just using from a vendor that's providing them. So those are kind of the four areas that we could have remote access. I'm just going to start with that because even that isn't always obvious to everyone if you're not, this isn't something you do every day. So how do we get here? <clears throat> we had a campus, we had a firewall, everyone went through that. That was pretty straightforward. It worked pretty well because all of our data was housed in one location. Kind of moving on, we had a private cloud. Usually it was a direct connection, maybe MPLS, but either way, it was on your own uh, it was on your own network, your own backbone, so you could avoid people uh, accessing that. You got branch offices, again, MPLS, still work, fairly secure, fairly expensive. And then what really kind of, I think, drove this, and this is true for lots of things, is we started getting remote workers, right? And now they had a VPN in, and while it worked, it was a hassle, nobody really liked it, it was slow and clunky, and everyone kind of talks about that whole funnel effect where you had to go through the main office in order to get to wherever you wanted to get to from an application perspective. Um, and at first that was a cost issue and it, it's still kind of a cost issue. Bandwidth has come down a little bit. So it's really just kind of a hassle issue. And it's also a cost issue from an infrastructure standpoint. And what kind of pushed a lot of people over the edge is 
I have other devices, what do I do? And for a long time, mobile devices were like, nah, I don't know, just don't access our ac applications with that. So that was kind of a black box. Um, and still to some extent, it, it kind of is in the old school uh, way of setting things up. So this is just kind of a, a quick way of, of or, or quick look at how, we, how, how things have been in the past. Um, so we moved the data to the cloud, but what did that result in? It resulted in a couple things. One, now people from the outside, the various bad actors from the outside had access directly without having to go through the firewall anymore in order to get to our data. And we also had users that were using or going to websites they shouldn't have gone to. So we put in cloud access security brokers, which were simply let me filter out the websites users are going to. Again, they had to go through the central office to get there. And then we had users that were actually using their device to go straight to the internet. This is super common. If you don't have managed devices in your network, and a lot of small and medium businesses don't, frankly, a lot of enterprises don't. I mean, there's a BYOD movement that still exists. Uh, you effectively are bypassing a lot of these things. And now you're going straight to the internet where you can get to your SaaS and public cloud um, the same way that somebody who's not, who doesn't have your best interest uh, <laughs> at heart can do. So we were kind of forced to put cloud access security brokers, which is I wanted to make this conditional or contextual in order to get to my application. So. This, these are kind of the building blocks that got us to where we are today and the reasons why they were there. And what we've kind of replaced all of that with is, is kind of a sassy. And sassy is kind of that nebulous sphere in the middle. I'm going to talk a little bit about what goes into that sphere, but it's effectively all the users are accessing all of my data and they don't, doesn't matter where they are, or what they're accessing it with. And that's kind of the key to what sassy really represents. So with that said, what is it? Well, this was a term that was coined by Gartner about five years ago or so. Their definition is these are the five pillars. So this is these are kind of the talking points. If somebody asks, what is it? This is the answer. And this is what Gartner says the answer is. So it's kind of five different things. It's a software-defined network. I won't read this to you. You certainly can, can read it. But it, effectively, how do I get users connected to their applications with the understanding that users move, users use different devices, and frankly, applications and workloads are being moved from the public cloud to the private cloud and back, expanded in scope. So the, the, the target is moving and the location from which you're, you're targeting is also moving. So SD-WAN plays right into that. Less of an issue, frankly, with small and maybe even some medium businesses. Absolutely an issue when you start getting multiple locations, when you start having kind of an enterprise scenario. Um, and again, these sorts of conversations, the answer for a small business and the answer for an enterprise business are not the same. So some of this may or may not apply to your organization, but I'll kind of try to give you a broad brushstroke. Um, within there, some of the things that I mentioned, secure web gateway, I need to do some URL filtering so people aren't going to places they're not supposed to. Cloud access security brokers, how do I lock down a specific application so that only people that I want to can get to it? And that's hard. I mean, that's hard because the people who are doing it from the outside that you don't know and, and your users that are doing it from the outside that you do know it's difficult to differentiate sometimes and that's really what a cloud access security broker can do and finally firewall as a service um and this kind of started off as like dns protection back in the days i'm going to put my cisco hat on for a second umbrella was kind of referred to as dns protection and it still is it's it's more it's more than that um but that was really is the website that i'm going to really where i wanted to go and is it really authentic and legitimate um and for those of you who are maybe a little more kind of technical on the OSI model, I mean, firewalls of service is really like a layer three, layer four sort of thing, transport IP address, where cloud access security broker is really more of a layer seven sort of thing. Um, and that's kind of the subtle differences. And I'll talk a little bit more how these three middle circles have kind of smooshed together into one. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I think this can be difficult to understand. Um, from there, and then finally, zero trust network access. That is also something that you can ask three different well-informed people what that means and get three different answers. In fact, to that end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that just because I think it's important to kind of understand this comprehensively. What does zero trust network access mean? Well, as it lists there, it's kind of deny first, always verify. You wanna make it contextual. Where's the person that's accessing it from? If people should only be accessing it from North America, let's restrict IP addresses that aren't in North America. Not that that isn't something that, that uh, rogue uh, parties can circumvent, but it, it's it's, a way of differentiating the people you want from people you don't. And I'm talking a little bit about that. I'm gonna come back to the slide in a second, but just real quick, cause I get asked this a lot, zero trust network access, what does it even mean? I won't read these to you, but these are three different definitions that I think are all right. And they effectively kind of fall into one of three categories, which is that I wanna separate my workforce. I wanna assume that, that everybody accessing my data 
I don't know who they are. I need continuous authentication, a least privileged approach. My workload, I wanna make sure that if you're accessing a particular application, you can't get to stuff that you're not supposed to be able to get to, or that applications within my network also cannot get to applications that they're not supposed to be able to access. It's a bit of an east-west traffic, what lateral movement, uh, kind of a privilege escalation potential as well to limit uh, the, the access to just specific workloads that, uh, that is, the users are designed and supposed to be using. And then finally, workplace. So this is kind of a whole new WWW, but when it comes to ZTNA, it's a workforce, a workload, and a workplace. And I highlighted just real quick the things if you wanted to kind of boil this down to what zero trust means, it's least privilege authentication, segmenting your network, and conditional contextual access. That's kind of a real super quick meaning of what that what that boils down to. And back to my Gartner, what's sassy and kind of the five pillars, software defined, how to get to where you're going. The three components in the middle is making sure that the traffic is, is authentic and legitimate. And then finally, the zero trust network access component of it, which if I really diluted it down, is kind of multi-factor authentication. It's more than that. But to put things in simplest terms, multi-factor authentication, I will tell you that this is an interesting little side note. Uh, I was at Microsoft, what was it? Inspire, Insight, something that started with an I, uh, a few years ago and the director of security walked on stage and she said multi-factor authentication and she walked off stage. And it was, it was powerful because she came back on a minute later and said, nothing I'm gonna say in the next 59 minutes will be as, as important as that. Uh, so that actually, I, I, that's always stuck with me as one of the most important uh, components of security. So. That's just a real quick stroke, uh, brushstroke here to a kind of a shameless kind of Cisco association because that's the world that I live in from a Cisco perspective. What does this translate to? Well, when SD, SD WAN, it translates to Meraki. For the three in the middle, Secure Web Gateway, fire, Firewall, and Cloud Security Broker, it translates to Umbrella. And for zero trust, net, zero trust Network Access, it kind of translates to Duo. Other vendors have kind of a similar setup. Some have some components of these and, and not others. Uh, it's not uncommon for somebody, for a vendor who used to, be, to do firewall, to now do firewall and cloud access security broker, but maybe not multi-factor and SD-WAN. And that's kind of why historically this has been a multi-vendor solution. And you're seeing that that's, gonna change, that's kind of changing. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as I go forward. So with that said, um, that's kind of a it, real quick overview. Again, we only have about 20, 25 minutes, but but what SASE is, I'll kind of pause for 10 seconds and Kaylee, if there's anybody who wants to talk about that component of it. All right, moving on. How does this apply to the picture? I'm a picture guy, a picture's worth a thousand words. So where is it that all this fits? And all this fits is here. The SD-WAN component of it, whether you're a remote or worker, campus on the campus environment, branch office, and regardless of what device you're accessing, you go to your icon or you go to your web address, you go to where you go and the network figures it out. It figures out how it's gonna get there and then it figures out where the application is that you wanna use and gives you the best path there. If the application has moved its location, it figures it out. That's what software defined WAN is in a very simplistic nutshell. It doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter where you're going, the network figures it out for you. That's the, again, this is something that applies less to, I think, small businesses, but it applies in, in almost all enterprise applications. And there's some kind of blending as you get somewhere between small business and enterprise. So that's kind of step one, the SD-WAN. The three things I talked about, what secure web gateway, firewalls of service, cloud access security broker. Those are all kind of in the middle area that as the traffic gets funneled through, it gets funneled through each of those. And like I, I mentioned, each of those has a very specific role. And as John kind of alluded to, we're gonna have a few different webinars going forward that's going to kind of focus on each one of these components on SD-WAN, on the, the outbound component of it, the three shown in the center there, as well as the inbound component, which is largely the zero trust piece of it. Um, I think the thing that's made this particularly confusing, at least for me, frankly, is that you used to see vendors that did one of these. They did Secure Web Gateway, and that's what they did. Or they were a CASB, they were a CloudX security broker, and that's what they did. The lines between these three have certainly been blurred that most vendors now do some variation. So it's important to kind of understand what it is that you need and really understand what each of these three components do. 
And then what it is that your solution can offer and run the costs and things like that. But understanding the individual components, I think helps you make an informed business decision as far as what's right for your, your organization. And then finally, the gray line here, in spite of our best efforts, we still have remote workers that if you're, if you have an unmanaged device, you have a cell phone, if you have a laptop that is your own, if you have a Mac, because your organization doesn't want to have to deal with supporting Macs, I see that all the time, they can get to the internet directly. From there, they can get to the public cloud. From there, they can get to the SaaS applications exactly the same way who you, of somebody you don't know, as shown in the top here, would get to it as well. So what do you do? You're effectively bypassing all the things we've talked about so far, and I can still get to the applications. What do you do? And that's really where Zero Trust Network Access has come into play. Again, multi-factor authentication being the primary component, but some other components being conditional, where you're accessing from, contextual, uh, um, I'm sorry, when are you accessing it? If I only want it to be done during the day, uh, if I only want it to be done for certain devices, I don't want to allow devices that are unmanaged to access my data. This zero trust network access is where it falls into kind of the last line of defense and in the case of like the gray line where people are maybe circumventing some of the infrastructure that's in place, um, either because you allow it or because it's shadow IT and you don't allow it that it happens, that's a key component of it, which is why all of these components kind of group to form SASE, but it's important to recognize that they may not be applicable in your situation. In all organizations, do you not necessarily need all of these things, but it's important to understand what they are. All right. Pivoting back to Cisco for just a second, these are kind of the dividing lines in terms of WAN connectivity, outbound cloud protection, inbound access protection that John alluded to. And these are the things we're gonna kind of drill down a little bit more on in future webinars. In the case of Cisco, it's kind of a unified SASE approach we call Cisco Plus Secure Connect. Other vendors have either a similar approach in terms of all of them together or have individual components of it. Again, I will say that SASE is kind of moving towards a single vendor approach just because one of the biggest obstacles that we've had up to this point has been trying to integrating and cobble to, cobbling together the SD-WAN from one vendor, the firewall from a different vendor, the, uh, the multi-vector authentication from a third vendor. So that's kind of where the industry is going. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in the last five, six minutes or so, which is where are we in the hype cycle? And I will tell you as somebody who's been doing this for almost 30 years, like I, I know that whenever something comes out, it's the next great thing but it takes time for that to kind of be worked through. And that's really where we are with SASE. When this came out in 2018, I mean, this sort of 2019, it was kind of the four C's. It was a movement to the cloud. Everyone wanted convenience from whatever device they wanted access to. It was cost. I want to go, um, I want to go OPEX, not CAPEX. And it was COVID. This is what prompted the movement to the cloud and the movement for data to be outside of our, our perimeter. It was going to be easy. It was going to be secure. It wasn't going to be a single point of failure. I wasn't going to have to worry about a server crashing and have all my data go with it. I was going to have some distributed cloud infrastructure that was going to make everything easier. Well, <laughs> it made certain aspects of it easier, and it probably did make these the environment more robust. But with that came the level of security that kind of brought us to where we are today, which was there were multi-vendors, varying outcomes. If you'd had taking a look at a SASE webinar three or four years ago, maybe even three or four months ago, but I mean, really, you can get different answers to what this question is. And it's only really recently has the, the, the decision or kind of the, the industry coalesced around what it really means. Um, and you're starting to see single vendor solutions. In fact, Gartner just released a single vendor SASE magic quadrant uh not long ago which i'm going to talk about on the next slide here um which is that there aren't very many vendors that do it but that's the industry well that's where the the trend is going is to get all of this from a single vendor because there's lots of different integration components so where is this going in short i will tell you that up to this point sassy deployments including all of these or even all of these without sd wan has been a low percentage, especially from an enterprise, I mean, especially from a small business standpoint, but even from an enterprise standpoint, Gartner really predicts in the next two years, that's gonna change and it's gonna change dramatically. Um, you're gonna see it go from, yeah, what does it say here? 10% to a third, and you're gonna see uh, you know, 50% from an SD-WAN standpoint. Again, shameless plug, I'll tell you, there's only two vendors that are on the top half of the Gartner Magic Quadrant for SD-WAN, single vendor SASE and SSE. The other one's Palo Alto. They're a good vendor. I have nothing bad to say about Palo Alto. 
Uh, but Cisco is definitely the leader in this area. And, and one final thing I'll say about this, um, as I'm going to wrap up here pretty soon, is SSE, uh, which is a little different than SASE, right? What is that? Just real quick so you know, in case you were wondering, SASE is the WAN component of it and the security component of it on the right side. SSE really just kind of takes the WAN component out. Their SSE really is a subset of the SASE, but I'm starting to hear more and more as people talk SSE when maybe the WAN piece of it doesn't apply to the organization. So I think it's important to know what the difference is and, and to understand that. So um, just to kind of go, go back to this, whether it's the security component of it, the network component of it, or just kind of a single vendor solution, uh, again, my Cisco hat on, they're uh, one of the leaders in that category. All right, so just in my last couple of minutes here, how, how much of this do I have to apply to my organization? Well, I mean, that depends on a lot of things. It depends on your industry, your size, your risk tolerance, your compliance requirements. There is no one right answer here, but here's what I can tell you. Everything should be perfect, perfected with multi-factor authentication. I don't care who you are. That is, in my, and not even really just my opinion, but that is the industry opinion of the, the least expensive, most effective way of protecting your applications. If you are not doing that in everything that has sensitive data, you're making a mistake because it's pretty easy to do and it's very effective. Password compromise still represents the biggest point of failure, despite all the discussion of complicated systems, which is true, but a lot of times it just comes down to passwords. So even though users don't necessarily like it, very effective. DNS protection, network firewall, again, layer three, layer four, there are components of this beyond DNS protection that you should actually consider. Intrusion prevention, analyzing data as it comes in and out of your WAN and looking for trends, looking for patterns of nefarious traffic. That's something else a network firewall can do on a layer three and layer four level. Whether that's appropriate for your organization, again, that's up to you, a risk tolerance question and the size and, uh, of your organization is what's, what's big. Secure web gateway, almost every organization has this to some extent to do some level of URL filtering, how granular, granular you want that to be is up to you. In a secure web gateway, you can also get malware detection. I strongly recommend that, but some people just choose to choose malware at the endpoint. Not the safest scenario. Again, your mileage may vary. Uh, and then finally, CASB, and that's something I think has been slow to being adopted. I do think it's a missed op uh, opportunity um, because application protection is ultimately what it's about. And often now you're seeing rogue actors no longer do it on IP level or transfer level. They're just doing it straight up on an application level. And if you don't have a CASB in place to, to try to prevent people from getting to your data via an application attack, you're missing what has become a more and more commonplace uh, attack vector. And finally, SD-WAN. I put stuff in gray that I think is a nice to have. Uh, my... my <laughs> Suggestion would be get all of it, but that's not practical. I think you, everyone has to sit down and really have a discussion um, with, with their internal team and understand what their customers need and expect and what their organization needs to do to figure out what it makes what makes sense. SD-WAN, hugely popular, generally just with larger um, organizations. And then finally, my last couple of things I'll wrap up here is, you know, from a Cisco perspective here, what are the flavors? Like what, what if I just get like a small version versus a large version. Cisco has kind of two flavors. There's essential and advantage. What are the difference? The difference is the size. I can protect 10 apps instead of 300. And also some of the other things I talked about. I can do layer sever protection, data loss prevention. If I want to be able to check that information being sent out of my databases does not include social security numbers or, or um, HIPAA information, I can do data loss prevention with kind of the advanced flavor of SASE where that might be something that maybe doesn't apply to my business or is not something that falls in kind of a risk tolerance prevention uh, decisions as an organization. So that's why there's two flavors. Again, different solutions have different options. I think Cisco's done a pretty good job of kind of itemizing out kind of a, what I would kind of do a, a full sassy and kind of a sassy light. And those are the salient differences. So with that said, we, I, know, I know we wanted to leave a couple minutes at the end if there were any questions. That was a lot. That was a lot to go through in 20 minutes. Um, but we're going to kind of drill down a little bit more on some of these topics, and it's going to really be split uh, into the three, these three categories. Um, from a Cisco perspective, again, Meraki in the left, Umbrella in the middle, which is per, per, perhaps one of the, the biggest conversation I get from a Cisco perspective. Uh, and then finally, um, Duo on the right, as far as inbound access protection is concerned. So. Uh, those will be forthcoming. I think the plan is at this point to kind of do one every month. So if this is something and we try to kind of keep these short, I know everyone's time is precious and there's 
kind of a lot to know. So my, my goal was for that you could walk away from this, at least being able to articulate what SASE is, understand the risks associated with it, and then have that conversation with your, uh, you know, your people internally, with Hummingbird, as far as what makes the most sense for your organization, what you should do. So that's all I have. I'm happy to answer questions. If there are any, um, I'll ask that and then. Let's see. Uh, thanks, Kurt. That was great. Um, would you mind going back just two or three slides real quick? I just want to mention a couple things. Sure. One, yeah, that one. Okay. Yeah. Nope, one more. Oh. Uh, uh, like the next one. Are here or the... Right there. That's the okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, thank you. This that was that was great. That was a great overview of everything that's going on. SASE is a big deal. It's 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 a lot to take in. There there. It's not just one thing. People think people call us and talk to us and say, hey, I need a SASE. Like they don't even know what it is. They don't they don't understand that it's a that it's kind of a frame of mind. It's not necessarily a product itself. It's made up of products and it's made up of software and it's made up of architectures and, and all that, but it's not an actual product. So and, and the thing that we always suggest is we we always suggest like knock out one at a time. Right. If you have a limited budget, knock one out at a time. Biggest one, obviously, is a firewall. After that, we usually go right to multi-factor authentication, which you said is so important uh, on so many levels. And the good news is that you know we are, you know, if you don't even know what that is and you've never tried, well, if you weren't a believer in MFA, well, good news is that uh, there's going to be a lucky winner on the, the call today that will will get some some uh, free licenses. Uh, so, but I just wanted to mention that that it's overwhelming. It's it's not something that can be done overnight. It's not even something that can be done very quickly, even if you wanted to. Um, but uh, if you need any help with any of this, engaging and, and have any questions, there's there's no cost. We have complimentary engineers, Cisco engineers, like Kurt and other folks uh, on staff and with our partners that could help with different um, security pieces. And we didn't even get into anything like talking about network penetration tests, vulnerability tests, firewall rule audits, security compliance requirements. Um, all this has to do with, you know, cybersecurity insurance and, and what kind of exposure you have out in the network and to your customers um, out there. And it's extremely important. Um, people are coming down very, very hard on on breaches and all that. So it's extremely important to at least start looking at this. Um, there's really a low cost to entry to a lot of this stuff. So again, if you have any questions, there's no cost to any of this to just talk to us, talk to Kurt, talk to the folks at Cisco or anybody else regarding any any questions about SASE or anything else. So. In the meantime, let me get let me get a couple other things uh, going here. Uh, if you have any questions for Kurt, please throw them in the uh, in the chat. We answered most of the questions that were there, so we're good in that regard, housekeeping wise. Um, I do want to mention while you guys are writing your your questions in there, if you have any, that we do have future webinars that Kurt mentioned. Um, and uh, you know, please let us know if there's really anything that we can do to help. It's 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 very important to have that stuff in your network. Um, and regarding the winner for, we, we, we are giving away uh, five licenses for Cisco uh, products for Cisco Umbrella, which is their DNS protection product, plus a whole lot more. If you've known OpenDNS and you know Umbrella, it's, and you even knew it two years ago, it's, com it's much more than that than just two years ago. It used to be just DNS protection. It's much more than that now. Um, and when you're talking about DUO, that's their multi-factor multi authentication. We're also giving away some licenses for that. That has evolved over the last couple of years as well. So um, we will give you the, uh, the winner. We will send out the winner. We'll contact the winner directly uh, for those licenses and set those up with the winner directly. So it doesn't look like we have any additional questions. Uh, actually, hold on, let me just make sure. Uh, it looks like all the questions have been answered. So you guys have a great day. Thank you so much, Kurt. Thank you, everybody, and thank you very much for attending. You guys have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks. Yep.